And let me just double check here and bring um, Dr. Kayla on. How are you doing, Dr. Kayla? Uh, doing great, thanks. It's a real joy to be on the show with you. Yeah, fantastic. We just announced our new graduates. We're getting, um, you know, five, six, seven a week people uh, graduating from the course. It's just, just the most wonderful thing in the world, um, you know, having people join our family of uh, functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners. I, I want to quickly, and, and I appreciate your um, support too, you know, uh, when I met you a few weeks ago at Paleo Effects, uh, we had a real nice chat, and I said, you know, I just have to have this nice lady on with us. I want to introduce you to my gang. So we have 2,500 FDNs in about 50 different countries. They're not all listening right this minute, but we get hun- hundreds of downloads uh, every week, you know, with the different time zones. People can't be here live. Um, we're going to invite people to uh, call in with questions. Um, they don't always... Uh, feel like it, you know, but um, we'll see if we can get some questions going. And I know a few things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, But let me first give people a little bit of an idea who you are. And again, I met you at Paleo Effects. Um, I'd heard of your book, um, and and you're known as the naughty nutritionist because you tell the truth is too hot to handle, right? That's right. (laughs) So not everybody would describe me as nice, which you so kindly did. <laughs> You're really a nice lady. I mean, I just had a great time meeting you and talking to you there. You were very friendly. Um, you had a one of the vendor's booths there um, with some coworkers here. And you're the co-author of a best-selling book called Nourishing Broth, an old-fashioned remedy for the modern world, and also the, the author of The Whole soy story the dark side of america's favorite health food these are critical books and information that all of our listeners uh, would be interested in and and um probably should read so again nourishing broth you want to look that up it's by uh, kayla daniel and um you know all this will be in our uh, newsletter it's already gone out in our newsletter we'll be posted on our facebook group and everything after the show so people could follow up, um, look for those books. And um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you wrote about there. But I want to tell everyone, too, that you received the Integrity in Science Award from the Weston A. Price Foundation. And that's a foundation that we have supported for a long time. I supported that um, way before I ever even started FDN or the FDN course. Um, I've been a member of Weston A. Price Foundation, a contributor, an advertiser in their regular magazine for a long, long time. And also, um, you received the Health Freedom Fighter Award from Freedom Law School back in 2009. I think that's an amazing thing. I could spend a whole show with you just on that because you know, I'm a paralegal uh, from University of San Diego and um, mostly in environmental law, but um, you know, I do a lot of uh, contributing and supporting of the Health Freedom foundations around there's lots of associations you can belong to and contribute to and things like that so i think that's something else we have in common and also you received the badass award from the paleo paleo primal price foundation and that was just last year and you know i've been called worse things myself (laughs) (laughs) i'm very proud of you you know i mean i like being a badass and um, you also been a guest. This is just the the final part here. You've been a, des- a guest on Dr. Oz Show, uh, PBS Healing Quest, NPR's People Pharmacy, on ABC. You've been on View from the Bay and on Discovery Channel's Medical Hot Seat. You've been there, and you've appeared with Dr. Mark Hyman, J.J. Virgin, Gary Tufts, Charles Poliquin, Joe Mercola, even, and lots of other people. So. Um, I really respected and appreciated meeting you, and uh, here we are on the show together, as I promised, so let's see what we can get into, okay? Sounds good. All right, fantastic. So, um, listen, in some of your, I mean, when you when you are known as the naughty nutritionist, uh, usually people will think right away that, um, you know, it's going to be just, uh, you know, on the 
sexual side or something like that. But actually, it just has to do with life and things we all are dealing with, right? Like, um, uh, what do you want to say about that, just generally speaking? i got some specific questions here for you, but um, how did you get to be known as the naughty nutritionist? <laughs> well, I am a very edutaining person. Uh, I like to combine uh, mischief and fun with, with solid information. So it's not just all about cleverness. And I think laughter is good medicine, and I also think a whole lot of people are overwhelmed with all the inconsistent and contradictory dietary and health advice, and making it more fun for people is a win all around. Yeah. Well, I, I'm with you 100%, and we we, uh, we explore our dark side here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the other thing is it, it's naughty because the establishment medicine considers fats bad and cholesterol evil, and, and I say quite the reverse. They'll say soy's good, I say it's bad, and so it goes. Let's talk about fat. We'll start up there. Like In your book, you explain fats of life. T- tell our listeners a little bit about fats of life. Well, first of all, we all need to understand that the, the fats Mother Nature created for us are, are very healing and needed for, for good health and energy and good moods. Uh, what we need to be aware of is the contrivances from Father Technology, things like vegetable oils and uh, margarine shortening and so forth. But we need the good fats to make reproductive and feel-good hormones. They are the base, <laughs> so very, very important. And, in fact, they're profoundly affecting every cell, tissue, and organ in our bodies. So if we're going low-fat or we're putting bad fats into our body, everything starts to fall apart pretty quickly. And I think that's a good reason why so many people are reporting low energy, very little endurance, poor immunity, uh, brain fog, and, and a lot of problems. And, you know, in there, too, loss of libido. We need yeah. fats. We need cholesterol. <laughs> You know, that's something that our audience here, you know, at the end, one of the first lessons is on steroidal hormone metabolic pathways. So we, we know that uh, pregnenolone, which pretty much the parent of all your steroid and sex hormones, is made mostly from cholesterol. So, so, um, but it's, and it's amazing how, um, like now we're getting an idea of what you mean by by naughty, it, 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 you know, because you're willing to say the things that no one else is. Well, the textbooks make it really clear. Cholesterol is the root of the hormone tree, and that's a very understandable way to describe it as well. If you're gardening, you you water and fertilize the roots. You don't sprinkle it on the branches. So the focus of, of much of medicine has been on the branches, and cholesterol is the roots, and we're being told to avoid cholesterol, and uh, lots of problems resulting from that. The tree's not growing well, and that's the reproductive hormones and the mood hormones. Yeah. So have you seen some kind of correlation between the... Let's say let's take uh, infertility for instance. We have quite a few FDNs uh, who are moms who were infertile or you know having trouble conceiving, and then after just getting healthier, they all of a sudden they're having babies uh, left and right. You know, it's it's an amazing thing that that's it's one of our niches, if you will. Like if you're an FDN, you can help anybody with anything, but. But people like to niche, and so infertility has become a big niche for us. So it's how does a, that? It, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a huge niche because um, infertile couples are desperate and willing willing to pay for it, and they want it they want it now. So it's a wonderful niche, and it's growing. One in seven couples is experiencing infertility, and a lot of experts predict it'll soon be one in four. That's a heck of a lot of people. And it's the result of the pushing of low-fat diets and the warning is against cholesterol and so many factors. And uh, the high soy diet, all those things uh, bring on infertility. And then, of course, many, many people have very unhealthy lifestyles, not getting enough sleep, multitasking, uh, all those stressful situations have an impact on health in general and fertility in particular. Yeah, it's, it's amazing um, how many Americans are experiencing the the infertility, but 
it seems to me like they don't even have the desire any you know like like you mentioned libido earlier sexual dysfunction i think it's uh you know is that all diet related or you know how how would you where would you put cholesterol or fat or you know diet in that picture the diet is very very important and a lot of people uh, i w- i was amazed that uh when i discovered that Viagra sales are not just to men over 50, that a whole lot of them are to college-age men. And years ago, that would not have been true at all. Something has really, really shifted, and that's a change in the wrong direction when our young men are, are not experiencing sexual desire. So it's a very widespread problem. There's a lot of Viagra use and... Um, I think there's a dietary component, but we shouldn't think it's just diet because there's problems with um, environmental estrogen, say, in the water supply and plastics. Uh, there's many hormone-disrupting substances that people are exposed to. So it can be multifactorial and complicated to treat. You know, I think you're right. And uh, I heard that about uh, Viagra, that it was mostly people, I forget, it was like age 25 to the 35 were the, actually the peak consumers of that. It's pretty disturbing. Um, but where, so where does, um, when you mention the external estrogens and these things, I think that's huge. I, I personally think that there's a uh, feminine, feminization, if you will, or something that, you know, it could be a big part of that um, phenomena we just talked about, you know. And you know, besides plastics and, um, you know, the other sort of xenoestrogens, what about red meat? I mean, it, it's got a reputation for being dangerous, you know, like on the on the, the American Medical Association side because, um, you know, it's got fat. I mean, they always say, oh, don't eat too much red meat. There's too much fat in it. But I don't think it's that I think as much as it is the hormones, right? Or what, what do you say about that? Well, the medical establishment sees it as dangerous because of the fat and cholesterol. But the reputation of meat as dangerous actually came in the 19th century when some vegetarian crazy men, people like Sylvester Graham and then later John Harvey Kellogg and others were promoting celibacy. And Graham invented the graham cracker, but back in his day, it wasn't the sweet thing we can buy now. It was something hard as a rock that could break your teeth. And he was recommending his graham crackers and other high-fiber foods and no meat uh, as an aid to celibacy. And so we have the word carnivore for meat-eating and carnal knowledge having to do with sex. So Graham uh, was actually touring the country and on the bully pulpit warning about sexual excess. And similarly, John Harvey Kellogg of the cereal family, uh, promoting vegetarian diets, high fiber with a lot of grains. And he saw red meat as, as promoting, promoting sex as well. So we've got a very interesting situation because back then they were promoting grains and also soy as, as aids to celibacy. And now we've got organizations, vegan organizations like PETA, promoting their diet as the sexiest on the planet. So it's it's really pretty funny when you look at the history. Well, I'm with you. I mean, what you're saying is you don't find vegetarians very sexy. I don't know. No, I, well, I like they claim they meat. <laughs> I want to go out with meat eaters. <laughs> well, they're a lot more fun in my experience. And, you know, going back to the couples trying to become pregnant, I've certainly found working with them that when they stop being low-fat, bring meat and fat and eggs back into their diet and things like cream in many cases, they can become pregnant very, very quickly, uh, often too quickly because they believe they're infertile. And I'm saying, make sure you don't get pregnant for a while because we want to get you really healthy first. And then three weeks later, guess what? <laughs> it can happen very quickly sometimes. Well, I want to uh, just mention that, and the um, the audience may have heard me say this more than once, but when we work with the couple usually that is trying to get pregnant, we often 
know that it's going to happen before we want it to happen. As the practitioner, we want them to go through, you know, six, nine, twelve months of rehab on their whole body. Now their goal is just to get pregnant, and what and our goal is like, no, we we want you to get pregnant. We understand that's what got you to come to us. Like, but we don't really care what the symptom is. We we want you to go through a whole program. Again, um, nine, twelve months is is very reasonable to get healthy, and and then get pre- so you almost want to start using birth control. So t- trying to convince someone um, whose main goal is to get pregnant uh, that look at you know you're going to get pregnant before we're done with you. You know, so so don't get pregnant. It, it's it, it's a hard concept for them to follow, but I, I, it comes from having been working with someone for just two or three or four months, and uh, all of a sudden they're pregnant, and it shuts your program down. Like you might have it been does. treating parasites, bacteria, funguses, viruses, and th- you, you know, like they're going through uh, protocols that uh, you don't want to be doing while you're pregnant. So it's like they got pregnant too soon. Do you, you know what I mean by that? Does that ever happen? You well, I, I do. And another big concern of mine is the toxic metal load because if we don't clear those first before a woman becomes pregnant, then, then her baby's going to be born with high aluminum, high mercury, high lead, you know, whatever whatever mom and dad have have given that child. And uh, people don't often realize that the man contributes as well, that mercury, for example, can be carried on the sperm. So we want to detoxify in terms of heavy metals as well as clearing those other issues you mentioned, like parasites and candida, viruses, et cetera. Yeah, that's um, something, too. You you know, it's hard to get rid of one if you aren't getting rid of both. You know, you, you want to work on... Both both aspects, I guess, detoxifying metals as you know helps you to treat candida, for instance. You know, it seems to be perpetuated by metal toxicity. I don't know if you found that to be true. I have a lot of people come to me after they've been taking probiotics for years and they've done all sorts of other leaky gut protocols, but they're still carrying a big load of mercury, and and as long as that's there, it's not going to heal up. Yeah. Um, do you, are you a fan of chelation on that subject, to, just out of curiosity? I have found people who've been harmed with chelation uh, too much too fast for sensitive people, so I like to do it with hair mineral analysis and body balancing, more a slow and steady steady way to go about it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, that's more in line with what we have done. Although I've had personally had chelation, um, or, or I'll more say IV treatments. I, I've had quite a few, and uh, um, it's a good way to get some um, minerals and vitamins and uh, you know glutathione and things in, so that you're just kind of enhancing your detoxification. You're not really going to, in there with the EDTA and, and trying to rip it out, you know. Yeah, I think if you're seeing the right practitioner and you're being well cared for and very carefully monitored, that's a faster way to go. But done wrong, it can really send sensitive people into uh, long-term health problems that are that are challenging to fix. <laughs> yeah. So you you said that um, uh, Kellogg and um, and this other guy were you know who were celib you know they were into celibacy and they were telling people don't eat red meat for that reason because it's going to make you less of a celibate, I guess, which... <laughs> well, they found that the naughty behavior went up. <laughs> yeah. Well, mine every day, that's a good thing. Now, what about things like bacon? I mean, can bacon really be good for you? Or is, it, is it considered a meat, uh, red meat, or how, how do you look at that? Well, bacon is, is uh, in the mainstream, uh, considered pretty much the most evil product anybody could eat. And then, of course, people have sayings like, bacon makes everything better. <laughs> and it's so tasty. Uh, I want to make totally clear, I'm not recommending supermarket bacon. I'm recommending bacon from pastured pigs, quality product. And if you're eating that kind of bacon, first of all, it's got wonderful fat. Bacon fat is wonderful. Definitely save it like our grandparents probably did. 
and it's mostly a monounsaturated fat, but it's about 40% saturated. So as a result of that saturated component, it is very unlikely to go rancid. So it's a nice stable fat. So it's not only great for cooking, but it gives your food good flavor. So it's not hard to eat a good diet if you've got bacon flavor involved. So those would be some of the good reasons. Um, it does include vitamin D and and also just in terms of things like weight loss. If you're satisfied and really happy with a little bacon, you're going to be less likely to crave other things. You know, got to have some pleasure in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you 100%. My, my mom actually did save the rendering, you know, bacon fat and then cook our eggs in it. You know, it was... Um, and we were really healthy growing up in Canada. Um, you need you need fat, and so I, maybe I don't know what the bacon was like back then, for a grocery store versus um, pasture raised or what. But I think it was pretty good. It was probably fine back then. Yeah, way way back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, now there with these. Plant based diet, you know. So again, you kind of mentioned Kellogg, and of course he was a he might have been promoting grains because he sold cereal. You know, I mean that was maybe another part of it. But there are a lot of plant based diet fads out there. What, what's the main complaint, complaint with that? Well, the worst problem is if it's a vegan diet. So there's there's uh, no animal products in there, and we need a lot of the nutrients that are only available from animal products. Mm -hmm. So, and that would include some of the good quality saturated fats, but also things like true vitamin A, vitamin D, uh, vitamin K2, which is the one we need. Uh, Mm -hmm. It would include things like CoQ10, taurine. Uh, Many of these things are just not available or not particularly available from uh, plant foods. Now, if you're talking plant-based diet, including some good fats and animal foods, etc., say something like Dr. Terry Walls is recommending. You know, she's got her, what, nine cups of vegetables each day, you know, three that are colorful and three that are leafy and three that are full of sulfur. And then there's meat in the diet. There's, um, uh, you know, other good things in the diet and basically eliminating the grains that cause so many problems for, for many, many people. So that kind of plant-based diet, I think, can be very supportive of health. But there's good quality wild fish and pastured um, beef and chicken in there, too. Okay. Yeah, I um, I would agree with that. Uh, but you're not a big fan of, of grains, then? Or, or how, how do you look at that? Do you need to be tested? Or what, is it based on genetics? Or what do you think about that? Well, it's a really complicated subject and probably much, much worse in the last um, few generations. So some of our ancestors could do well with grains, uh, but they were different grains than are available now. You know, the wheat back um, during biblical times was a different wheat than we have now, for example. And then we have uh, recent problems due to excessive eating. Uh, You know, we have people who, you know, they eat bagels, pasta, bread, cookies, crackers. It's wheat, 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 wheat. And, of course, they develop a problem. But uh, it is starting to look like gluten can be a problem for absolutely everyone on some level, some much worse than others. And a whole lot of people who've got health problems do seem to be well served by going gluten-free. And that can be tough, it can be very challenging, and sometimes getting tested is a real good idea just to get compliance with a client because the whole issue of even one molecule can set you back a few months. Uh, You have to be very committed. (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure, because otherwise you're going to grab what's available and um, the stuff is everywhere. Everywhere you go, people are shoving cookies at you, you know, or something like that, and they do taste awful good. (laughs) Well, it's really challenging. I mean, you can ask for a salad and say no croutons, and it arrives on your your table with no croutons, but what you don't know is that as it was coming out of the kitchen, the waiter realized, oh, we wanted no croutons, and he goes back in and takes them off, but there's a crumb or two there, 
and so boom. <laughs> if you eat the whole salad, uh, you've set off the gluten reaction again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is so challenging. It really is, but people, you know, again, you looking backwards, there's people when you take them off the gluten and dairy too, you know, for some reason, uh, they just do better. They just... Um, but yeah, we, I would like to think that that raw dairy could be wonderful for all of us, but it's just not the case. Yeah, and it's also hard to get, you know, if you did do well on it. Mm-hmm. You know, get it just anywhere down at the corner store or whatever. you got to kind of go through a bunch of hoops to do it. Yeah, where I live in, in New Mexico, uh, the raw milk comes from 700 miles away in Texas, so they're running a milk runner operation or a moonshine operation. <laughs> yeah. So now um, let's get into the real naughty nutrition stuff. What about um, food as aphrodisiac? You know, let's say, w- would you recommend that to a, a infertile couple, you know, low libido thing? I mean, like chocolate, is that a true aphrodisiac, or what do you think? Well, first of all, I'd point out that the very foods that are aphrodisiacs are also considered sacred foods for fertility. So all over the world we see uh, those particular foods, and what what we find is they're the high-fat, uh, high-cholesterol foods. So that would include all sorts of things, um, you know, there's the exotic ones, of course, um, that are considered aphrodisiacs, but day-to-day it would be the things like the meat and the eggs and the fish roe, uh, oysters, etc. Now, the, the chocolate myth is rather interesting. Uh, Montezuma supposedly ate chocolate and was able to walk 50 miles a day, had lots of strength and stamina, and supposedly was able to service a harem of, I don't know, 500 women. Um, And uh, people attribute his powers to eating chocolate. But what we have to remember is that the chocolate Montezuma might have been eating did not have any sugar. It was, you know, a very difficult to eat uh, dark chocolate with with no sugar whatsoever. Very different from what most people would be eating today. Yeah, you know, I see I see in the stores all the time now, especially where I, I shop at one of those stores with the more natural lean to it, and um, they have um, chocolate there with maca, and they have, um, they talk about the percentage I don't know if it's cocoa or cacao. I don't even know how to say that. But the true chocolate percentage, is that like real or is that just marketing? I think it's a mixture of both. And for people who can't have gluten-containing products and can't have sweets, uh, such as cookies, a uh, little dark chocolate can be a good solution for many of those people. And Dr. Tom O'Brien recommends something that I think is very useful to take a very small piece and let it melt on the roof of the mouth so it will go in very slowly. And then supposedly the happy chemicals go direct to the brain. So if you eat it that way in a very slow fashion, you're not going to need an excessive amount of the chocolate. Funny, funny, yeah. Um, Now, you mentioned oysters, that, uh, which I know are considered the king of aphrodisiacs. What? How did they get that? You know, do you think they deserve that reputation? Or, or? well, Casanova had a whole lot to do with that reputation, and supposedly he'd start his day with fifty oysters, and he'd he'd be there in the tub eating oysters with his lady or ladies of the day, and. There are many, many similar stories. Uh, For example, in New York City in the 19th century, early 20th century, there were oyster bars, and that's where you would go and meet prostitutes. Uh So there's there's quite a history of oysters and uh, oysters being aphrodisiacs. But um, in terms of the science, there's a whole lot of meats and fish and chicken that, you know, where, where they have zinc, and oysters, of course, have zinc. But scientists recently discovered something else in oysters, and that's something called N-methyl-D-aspartate, which actually kickstarts production of testosterone. So it might be something besides the zinc. <laughs> sounds good. You know, I, I might just go get some chocolate-covered oysters. <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> 
So besides that, what what other foods would uh, sort of spice up the love life for people? Um, if you go to a Japanese restaurant, Ikura, which is the salmon roe, and um, Catherine the Great of Russia, who worked long, productive days ruling Russia and then frolicked with the soldiers at night, her favorite food was caviar omelets. So she was getting both eggs from chickens, which are themselves very, very healthy and aphrodisiacs, so along with the fish roe. So she was, she was using, I think, herring roe. So that that is a great aphrodisiac. And in many cultures, cream, whipped cream, was considered an aphrodisiac. But in our modern world, it's more considered something not to eat but to put on the body and eat just a little bit of it. So not everyone handles dairy well. So that's an aphrodisiac that may or may not work for people. Uh, yeah, you and then know. there's – go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, let's see. You know, some of it's just the basic things from Mother Nature, foods that are rich in fat and cholesterol, and that's that's um, animal products. Use plenty of butter on your vegetables. Yes, have lots of vegetables, but use butter on them to improve the beta carotene converting to vitamin A and so forth. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. What I was going to say was I can remember being, I think I was, I was probably 21, 22 years old somewhere, and I was in a, I used to get, um, I used to like to go to this diner, and I would get milkshakes. I was, you know, and I would ask sometimes uh, for them to put a couple raw eggs in my milkshake. Now, I was just doing it for the nutrition. Um, A lot of the listeners know that at 19, I, I got this book called Healing Ourselves. It was a book on self-healing, and when I was 19, you were talking about 43 years ago, I was reading a book on self-health and, and taking care of myself. So anyway, so so I was, even way back then, trying to do things to get some extra protein or, or whatever it was. So I, would, I said to this oh, soda jerk, put a couple raw eggs in my milkshake. I was getting a chocolate milkshake. And he goes, oh, you must have a date tonight, eh? <laughs> and I, at the time, did went what? I, don't, I, I didn't know what he was talking about, but now, now I do. You know, it's supposed to, like you just mentioned, eggs and that thing. But that actually happened to me, you know, forty three years ago or whatever it was. Um, yeah, you know, at least forty years ago, I was putting raw eggs in my shake back then. I still do it. I still put raw eggs in my in my. Uh, now I'm using a different shake. Now I only use. Uh, you know, protein, and, and I, I use almond milk. Is it, like, I would not never use soy milk, but what about almond milk? Is that good? Please tell me it's good. <laughs> well, it's way better than soy milk, that's for sure. <laughs> and there, um, we need to really, regarding soy products, we need to practice safe soy, and that would mean eliminating uh, soy shake powders, uh, soy energy bars, uh any any uh, food products that include soy ingredients such as soy protein isolate, soy protein concentrate, textured vegetable protein, hydrolyzed plant protein, all of those modern, heavily processed technological foods that came in after World War II. So take care with the soy shakes. Uh, toss them. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't do soy anymore. Very, very little. Although at the sushi sushi bar, you mentioned um, ikura. Which is the same. I love that stuff, and I've actually noticed that I thought it was, you know, I mean, I didn't know if it was that or the sake that was giving me the extra libido. I, I, <laughs> I did feel something from that, you know. I've done that. I like ikura. It's a great food. I mean, um, but what, what about? Let's talk about soy for a minute, because I know you wrote a whole book on soy. You wrote the book on soy. How did that become known as a health food then, if it's so crappy? Well, it's all about marketing, and uh, the soy industry was making vegetable oil margarine shortening, and to do so, they were splitting that soybean and taking out the fat, so they had soy protein left over. So the best use for that would be as a fertilizer, but of course, the chemical fertilizer companies have that market cornered. And then they wanted to feed it to animals. But the truth is you can only feed so much soy to animals before they start having health problems. 
So the USDA did research for years trying to figure out ways to process the soy so they could feed more to animals, but they were not successful. Um, from the factory farmer's point of view, soy feed uh, for animals is useful to a point. You know, it'll fatten up the animals by damaging the thyroid, so that's good. But too much would cause fertility problems and cause the animal to die prematurely. So there was only so much they could do with that. So they got the bright idea of selling it uh, to people to eat. But there was a big problem. There was an image problem with soy. The image problem had to do with that only hippies ate it or people who were were living in poverty or people in uh, communist countries like Russia or Cuba. So soy had a terrible image problem. But some very bright marketing people got together and decided they could improve the image by turning it into a health food so that rich, educated people would eat it and the image would improve and everyone would be willing to pay for it. And not just pay for it, but pay a lot for it. So that's how it really got going. And there was an FDA health claim approved that came in in 1999. Soy sales went from under a billion a year to over four billion in about the next year. And the soy industry later tried to get a cancer claim approved with the hope of pushing the sales up to $8 billion a year. And I'm happy to say I, I put a stop to that um, yeah. through the Weston A. Price Foundation. Um, we got a petition out. It was signed by some leading scientists, uh, Dr. Mary Ennig, Dr. Kilmer McCulley, and others. So we stopped that one, but the myth is still out there that soy is good for menopause, that it's a health food, and people, um, you know, in in your group, the FDN people, I'm sure understand there's a lot of problems with soy, and the word is getting out, yeah. but the average American still thinks it must be good for us. Yeah, marketing, as you said. So um, now... Um, but there's another reason, though. I think even in the like in the bio um, the bioidentical hormone replacement kind of thing, they're synthesizing natural hormones, but it, but using I think soy is a substrate, and a lot of it comes from the other plants, the dyscorea and um, you know the the wild yam kind of a thing. But aren't they ex- somehow using um, soy to make hormones or? Uh, They are. Now, in terms of the prescription products, they've been treated in a very careful way so people know what they're dealing with in terms of dose and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a a drug, so to speak, it can be appropriately monitored. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the difficulties with the advice to just eat a lot of soy every day is there's no real knowledge of what dose is being used, how much people need, or even the safety during, say, a period in somebody's life cycle. Yeah. So, you know, using uh, bioidentical hormones should be done under the direction of a knowledgeable health practitioner. There should be some lab work. There should be some monitoring oh, yeah. of both symptoms and and the blood work and so forth. And, you know, working working with that information. Yeah, but the soy industry is basically recommending their products for men, women, and children, and even babies. And there's certain periods in in the life cycle where that's really dangerous, particularly for babies and children whose bodies and brains are developing. Yeah, um, maybe we could explore that a bit. But what about you know the cultures that do eat a lot of soy, like they're pretty much brought up on soy. I was I was starting to mention at the sushi bar, um, they serve edamame. I mean, is that a safe, is there a safe at level that you could, you know, um, like when you're actually peeling the the peas open and eating them kind of raw or something? What, what do you think about that? They're delicious well, with garlic sauce, you know. Oh, they are delicious. Now, if you're eating them at a Japanese restaurant, you're probably eating about six pods in a little bowl, and right. not a big deal. If you're mm-hmm. eating them at home, you know, bag loads of them and snacking on them like popcorn, you've got more of a problem. Right. But I wanted to get back to what you said about um, cultures that eat a lot of soy. Yeah. The only culture that actually eats a lot of soy would be Westerners who are vegetarians, and some of uh-huh. those are eating soy for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. 
Right. Now, it's it's a myth that people in Asia eat a lot of soy. Mm. Now, Asia is a huge continent, many countries, many different uh, dietary uh, choices, many different lifestyles, so it's mm-hmm. not the same from place to place. Right. But wherever we go, it's used as a condiment in the diet and not as a staple food. And the other thing to consider is that the traditional soy foods that were used in Asia would be things like fermented products like miso or in Japan natto, which is, you know, they're both wonderfully healthy, Mm -hmm. or tempeh in Indonesia. And even Mm -hmm. a little tofu once in a while in a small quantity, it's, it's not fermented, but it's a whole food. So those products, yeah. if they're coming from non-genetically modified uh, soybeans, can be good in a rich and varied diet. Hmm. Um, you know, cause I, like I, I love my miso soup, but I don't eat it what twice a month, maybe. And then I the same thing with the uh, with the edamame. I don't eat a lot of it, but but otherwise I stay away from soy. I certainly wouldn't want it affecting my health or um, my libido or anything like that. Do do you know if people who eat a lot of soy have any issues in that area, like sex drive or anything? Uh, They certainly do. And just before I address that, I just wanted to mention that that we see a lot of thyroid disease in people who consume a lot of soy. It's it's something Hmm. people will notice pretty quickly. Um, It's most often manifesting as hypothyroidism, low thyroid with symptoms like uh, fatigue, lethargy, weight gain, malaise, and and loss of libido. Thyroid's real important for that. But in terms of seeing things like uh, loss of libido, yeah, a lot of reports. And uh, there are some funny stories that, you know, for example, that Japanese wives will treat the unfaithful husband by giving him extra helpings of soy so he'll lose the <laughs> desire or he'll lose the ability or both. <laughs> oh my. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So I'll I'll have to watch out for that. Someone's not slipping some extra soy in my bowl, you know. <laughs> my, <laughs> well, my if you feed behave bowl. yourself, nobody will do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I cook for myself mostly. That's a good thing. So so you said the soy products are the healthiest, just to be clear, are the tempeh, the miso, and the, what was the other one? Tof, tofu. Uh, natto. Oh. Natto is wonderful, very rich in K2 from the bacteria. Okay, and then the worst ones would be what? The worst ones would include things like soy protein isolate, soy protein concentrate, hydrolyzed plant protein, textured Mm. vegetable protein, things like Mm. that. And I would say that the product that might be the most dangerous would be soy milk. And not because it's actually the very worst product that's out there, but because it's the one people are most likely to use to excess. Uh, Okay, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. No, I stay away from that stuff. Um, well, good. Now um, we're we're uh, been going on for a while here. I want to ask you that we actually had some people write in some questions. Let me ask Brandon. Does anyone raise their hand yet or anything? We have any live callers or want to remind everyone? Don't have any hands. Pr- Go ahead. Yeah, don't have any hands yet. All right. But, what uh, questions, Brandon, came in from the field? That, because you know we told everybody, Kayla, that you were going to be on today, and we had some people write in, right? Brandon, what do, what do you have? Yep, sure, sure did, yeah. So um, most of them uh, kind of revolved around um, some of the collagen and um, those type of, 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 of products, but one was uh, specifically asking Dr. Daniel about um, one you have um, there. It's the uh, pasture-raised, grass-fed type 2 cartilage collagen product. And she was just asking to maybe speak a little bit more about that. How does that compare to other, or does it compare at all to like glucosum and chondroitin supplements, that type of thing, and also the type 2 collagen versus other kinds. So she's kind of wanting to get a little bit of the background about uh, that product and why that um, seems like such a good one there. Okay. Well, that's a great question. Now, I recommend strongly that people include broth as part of their dietary foundation. And I'm talking about old-fashioned bone broth, which would be made with with the bones, with cartilage, with the skin. 
And, of course, there's marrow in that bones, too. So that's a real superfood, if you excuse the pun there. Yeah. Superfood there. And very digestible and a very big part of healing people because we all know you first start with the gut. So it's the number one thing for leaky gut. Now, not everybody likes to to cook every day and have the stock pot going or the crock pot going. Mm -hmm. So there are some supplements that, that can help out. And the collagen or the gelatin products are going to give you some of that wonderful substance that's, that's gut healing. And when we make our own broth and put it in the refrigerator, if it's a really good product, it's going to get jiggly like gelatin. So that's mm. a sign. But if yours doesn't gel and, you know, nobody's does perfectly every time, it's going to vary depending on what bones you're using, the concentration, just a lot of factors. So you can always add some of the the gelatin or you can use a collagen hydrolysate product, which uh, has been treated in such a way that it doesn't gel on you. So you can actually use something like that. Uh, You could add it to coffee, for example, or tea. There's no Mm. taste. There's no smell. There's no mouthfeel. And it's not going to gel up on you. I mean, uh, you know, starting with a cup of coffee, it cools off and then it starts to gel. I don't think most people would want to finish that. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, this is a wonderful product that you can just stir in. And that, I think, is where Father Technology is serving us. And the product that has my name on it, uh, it's with Vital Proteins, and it's called Mm -hmm. Dr. Kayla Daniels Cartilage Collagen. Mm-hmm. And it is primarily cartilage, you know, such as you have in your knees and so forth. But, you know, there's various places where type 2 collagen will be found in the body. And and these products come primarily from the bovine tracheal, bo- bovine trachea. Mm-hmm. And that was the research Dr. Pruden did. And he was a doctor's doctor who lived from 1920 to 1998. And he's called the father of cartilage therapy, and he Mm -hmm. did a lot of amazing research. And his credentials were impeccable. He worked with the best and the brightest. He published just a few articles in the very, very best journals. And his work uh, began with using cartilage to help with wound healing. He uh, was a surgeon who was helping Korean War war veterans to recover from terrible, terrible injuries. So he first discovered that it was helpful with wound healing. And then some of the wounds, he noticed that it cleared up things like psoriasis around the wounds, and that got him interested. And he started exploring it with other autoimmune things and um, also osteoarthritis. He found that people were regenerating cartilage, and this is people where it was bald, (laughs) And he was regenerating cartilage and found it worked with rheumatoid arthritis and then it experimented with other autoimmune problems like scleroderma and Crohn's. And Mm. these were incurable cases that he was reversing. And he finished up his career uh, doing some healing of cancer, stage four cases where modern medicine had given up. And the only treatment was the 12 pills a day of the bovine tracheal cartilage. Hmm. And these were clients from hell. They ate fast food. They did uh, both medical prescription drugs and recreational drugs in some cases. So the only intervention at all was the, was the cartilage. Wow. So he published all these results. And I strongly recommend this product, even though it's an expensive product, for people who are facing very challenging health problems. For most of us, having the broth, having the collagen is wonderful for prevention. But if you're talking about some sort of serious disease or disorder or athletic injuries, the cartilage can do wonders for people. How did you um, hook up with Dr. Pruden? Was it, did you know him personally or how? I did eight interviews with Dr. Pruden in 1997 and he and I were going to do a book together and mm. I actually got the book written but then the publisher dropped out because um, Dr. Pruden died and couldn't appear on the talk shows 
so for many years I had that manuscript just sitting around and mm. then the nourishing broth book opportunity came through and yeah. I realized it was a very very important part of the story of why broth can be so healing because see a good homemade broth will have cartilage in it yeah um, but, how does it comp- <clears throat> sorry go ahead in, in therapeutic terms, we don't know how much you're going to get in any cup of broth. You know, that's one of the challenges. You do not know from batch to batch what the nutritional profile of your mm. of your broth is going to be. Hmm. How, how does it compare with chicken broth, this, this kind of thing? Like, is there a big difference in between chicken and bovine? Um, well, there's good studies on chicken sternal cartilage and, and others. All the cartilages are good. It, it really came down to, you know, what would be a reliable source that was price okay. effective yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So any of the cartilages will be good. And some people just do chicken soup exclusively, and you're going to get mm-hmm. plenty of cartilage in there, especially if you use chicken feet. That's really the secret, chicken feet. Oh, yeah? Well... I'm not sure they're going to end up in my cuisine, but that's okay. <laughs> well, Bill, if you can make a pot of broth with just chicken feet, and it will be a beautiful, golden, very gelatinous, very delicious broth. Wow. Yeah, I mean. They've you know. been in my pot before, and it does turn out very good. Really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> good to know, Brandon. We've done it before. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. you got <clears throat> got to find the right place, the right source, but, but she's right. It does turn out quite good. Um, just don't tell on, anybody on a, what you <laughs> what, yeah. what you had in the pot. Just give them the broth. Yeah. <laughs> is there is there a time period that someone should take these things for and and stop, or would you say you can take it forever? Um, like, w- is it something you could get into your? You, you should just do daily. Like, let's say you had some joint pain um, or mo- mo- mobility issues, uh, and I see a lot of sort of older people kind of hobbling around. They just, it just seems to be their way. Is it, is it something you would just take for the rest of your life, or what do you think? Uh, Dr. Pruden's research suggested that it was not a quick fix and not a permanent cure either. Mm. Uh, he would say it will take at least four months of the full dose, 12 pills a day, mm-hmm. before you should expect to see cartilage starting to regenerate, for example. Mm. And yeah. there'll be ups and downs with things like psoriasis, for example, as well, and oh, also yeah. Crohn's. Uh, you know, it's not an instant turnaround, and sometimes there's some ups and downs. But four mm-hmm. months to to really start to see some results, and then needing to stay on it. Now, my personal observation is if you don't have serious health problems, um, clear them up with the 12 a day. And then if you're including broth in your diet, you know, only if you're also including, you know, broth in your diet and have a good overall diet and lifestyle, consider taper, tapering back. Say, so see how it goes with nine. If the symptoms come back, it's, it's kind of clear you need to be on the 12. Mm. But experiment slowly and steadily going down. And I say that because it is an expensive supplement. But with people who are experiencing joint problems, uh, serious arthritis, and also athletes, staying on the product can really minimize the chance of injury, and if there are injuries, they'll heal up a lot faster. So we know that the Los Angeles Lakers are on a diet that includes plenty of broth, and what I'm learning is there's some other teams that are starting to regularly include the, the bovine cartilage in their diets. So uh, that's just, just good for all of us who are trying to stay fit. Yeah, uh, well, um, and athletes athletes and old people, they tend to um, settle a lot of these questions for us, you know. We're all interested in, uh, interested in you know, just staying youthful or healthy or performance and these kind of things. Um, you know, we're getting near the end of the hour, and it went really fast, uh, Kayla. So uh, what, what else are you doing these days? Tell us what's in the future for you. Well, I want to move fo- forward with my Naughty Nutrition brand with, with the fun and the mischief. It, it makes mm-hmm. my heart sing. I really enjoy that, that part, yeah. of, part of my work. So um, I'm working on on some book plans and some website changes to to move into this new direction. 
That's fantastic. Well, uh, I think that you've probably opened up uh, the minds and hearts of some FDNs here. Again, I was just tickled to meet you and had such a good time talking to you in the your booth there um, that I thought I would just have to have you on, introduce you to my my gang, if you will. And um, you know, we we don't um, have people on just to sell their products or anything like that, but. Um, I think everyone would think it's fair if we just said where they might be able to look at your product. So I think it's vitalproteins.com, like spelled the way it sounds, vitalproteins.com, yeah. if they want to mm-hmm. take a look at your um, cartilage. It's all uh, pasture-raised, grass-fed beef, right? Right. It's it's very good quality product, and um, it, it's really helped a lot of people. And their other products, their liver and collagen and stuff, are excellent, too. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much. We're at the end of the hour. It's been great. And, uh, Kayla, I'd really like to speak with you about um, the next book you're writing, too. I, I have um, some thoughts about what might be a good book if you'd be interested in talking I to me about I would love that. to talk about that, Reed. Okay. Well, I'll be giving you a call. I, I know I have your um, email here and stuff because we've been in touch to get you set up for this show, but I, I'm going to um, talk to you next week then, okay? Sounds great. I look forward to it. Thanks again so much for having us on. Is there anything else, Brandon? No, I think it was a great call. We really appreciate you being on, Dr. Daniel, and uh, laying down so much information so quickly. It was an honor. All right, thanks a lot. We'll be talking to you soon. And bye, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Okay, bye-bye.